Big picture, let me tell you what we're going to do today. Uh, first, we're going to discuss a few investment ideas uh, that were originally posted on the Value Investors Club. Uh, and you'll use those as examples for uh, what you would hope to do on your project. You know, what, what actually can you write up in a page? Uh, what kind of investment thesis? And then uh, it won't have the backup. Um, but they're all from the Value Investors Club. And you can go back and study the whole message string that goes on. There's a whole discussion after. I'm just going to give you the little write-up. And then there's a whole discussion on each of these. And I'll explain how to, to look them up on the Value Investors Club for you. Um, anyone who's watching on video also can look all this stuff up on the Value Investors Club, even though we're going to have handouts today. Uh, and I'll explain how to find them. Um, the other part of the class will uh, have me sort of playing uh, Warren Buffett. Um, and your job, uh, hopefully, was to have read the compilation put together by Cunningham for today. And then you get to ask me questions. And I will try my best to answer them the way I think that Buffett would answer those questions. And for the, let me just see if I brought it. All right. Um, for the person who asked the best question of the day, they, they win this uh, Buffett comic book. Uh, originally uh, printed in Japan and now translated into English, luckily. So that can be yours. Um, once again, the, uh, the assignments due the 26th. We don't have class on the 19th. So we're basically going to have class next Friday, same time, same place. And then your projects will be due. So now's the time to ask questions about you know, what I'm expecting. Uh, we will have another project after this. And obviously, I'm expecting a much better job for that one. Uh, but this one, I hope to give you as much feedback as possible on so that you can you know, improve the work. Um, so let's start with what I would consider a good write-up. I can start passing these out. As soon as you get it, you can just read it. It's only a page and a quarter. Uh, this was written up in, uh, just to give you some context, uh, June of 01. For those of you watching, it's a write-up on, on NVR uh, written by Charlie479. And in the search function, you can just search for Charlie479 and find it, or you can search for NVR.
All right. Maybe another 30 seconds. All right, you got there. So who, who wants to describe the thesis here? And this was basic, a brief thesis as to, I mean, who can put it into, let's say, two or three sentences? You know, why this appeared cheap? Oh, could you put your uh, tags out if you could? Because if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to have to call on someone. Sorry? Sam. Sam, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I think the idea here is never really to take ownership of something unless you're going to do something with it. And then when you decide to do something with it, make sure that it's sold so that you don't end up stuck with it. Okay, so they're pre-selling. They're not building until they pre-sell, right? Anything else they're doing here? Buying back the stock. They're buying back stock. So you sort of know what they're doing with their cash, <laughs> right? Anything else? You know, what is a, t what is a typical home builder? What, what's the preconception of a typical home builder? Right, so in other words, usually home building has a lot of capital expenditure involved. You have to buy the land, you have to build the house, and then you go sell it. That could be a very capital intensive business, and then you hope to sell it. And the thesis here is that that that's not what these guys are doing. Number one, they're taking the land costs down by only buying options on land. So they have inventory to, to build in the future if they need it, but they're buying an option on the land. So that doesn't take up a lot of capital. And it's an option, so they're not obligated for the rest. Um, they're pre-selling, so they probably have money ahead of time before they have to start building and, and a pre-sold you know, I'm sure they're taking some risk there. I'd want to look in to see how much is actually put down uh, by the home builder before I start building, but I'm assuming they're collecting more money than they need to, to get going and then have a schedule to pay. Um, so this is sound, you know, it's a home builder, so it's not, you know, it's kind of a well-known industry, so yes? Right, I think he answers that in a, in a sense, he, you know, there's a size issue. In other words, not everyone can option huge tracts of land. Um, also, I would imagine in building, there's economies of scale. If you're building a whole development out, you can build stuff fairly cheaply. So you have to have some size, but there are other people with size. That's true. Yeah. Right, but I guess they're getting large returns on capital, so I guess so far they haven't been overpaying. I guess there's some some benefit. Yeah, I Chase. I want to see how they, uh, they actually did in the last downturn, because the, the big part of the thesis is that they're resilient to the downturn. Uh, so if they've been around long enough, Right, and um, my only guess here is that they've changed their business model. In other words, traditionally, it was they were buying the land, they were building the house and then trying to sell it, and I think it developed over a period of time. So I would say when this was written in 2001, the uh, last downturn had probably been in the early 90s. Um, and I would want to see if they were using the same business model at that time, and also you'd want to see how much their sales might drop off. Yes, just, David. All right, so that's interesting. But uh, one thing you could look by going backwards is um, by going backwards, you could see how much sales could possibly drop off. On the other hand, they're doing businessly different, uh, business differently because they're pre-selling. So obviously, they might collect just the deposit on some of these things, and maybe some of these sales might fall through completely, yes.
Right. So. Right. Well, you know, uh, one thing if you look at this, they have a long history of doing this. There are only so many people who can buy huge, these are huge tracts of land that they're, you know, build, buying for development. Um, so, you know, these are all good questions, but on the other hand, you have a company that, the thesis here, if I had to say it in two or, th uh, two or three sentences, is something, the fact that this is trading at eight times earnings, seven times forward earnings, uh, they don't put much capital into the business, they have things pre-sold beforehand. And if I were looking at this business, I'd say, wh when I'm looking at something that's earning a lot of money, I don't, I just care that that reverses and they've invested a lot of money and they lose a lot of money in the future. But with this, what looks attractive here is it's, it's selling at seven times forward earnings. They don't put a lot of capital into the business. They're not taking a lot of risks. So if there's another downturn, maybe they take a small lump for a period of time, but probably won't actually lose money. And they wait for the, the upturn to come and they'll earn that money. So perhaps this isn't normalized earnings. Perhaps it is, but it's seven times. Uh, there's almost nothing you could, you could, you could buy at that that level. So, you know, I cheated a little, so we, we know from 2001 how this worked out, and I'm not showing the bad ones, but uh, now you can see that, right? Um, let's make it incredibly small. All right, well, well, it was at 143 when this was written up, and I guess now it's over 800. So, uh, one of the problems there was you thought the real estate boom might end, but you were buying it at seven times earnings uh, with a very good business. Um, I doubt, uh, I happen to know, the guy who wrote it up, bless you, uh, didn't know this was going to travel up to 800, but I think he, he saw a double when he bought it, so I guess he had a margin of safety. All right, well, let's try another one. Uh, but the thesis was straightforward. They're not laying out money anymore, and uh, high returns on capital, low PE. I mean... And, and you can possibly understand why uh, you can possibly understand why you had this opportunity. So let's look at another one. Same same author. Yes. Well, well, passing that out, I just wanted to ask a question about this. Sure. One. What are sure. the assets of this company? They're not owning the land and they're selling it. They don't need much in capital. In other words, they're spending all their free cash. They don't need more capital because they're spending all their free cash, if you look at the numbers, buying back stock. Um, so what that says to me is it's very capital unintensive for a business that it was perceived as capital intensive where if there's a downturn, they'll lose their shirt. In this case, the model has changed. Uh, we had that history where it went bankrupt in 91, so maybe people were scared, oh, a downturn's coming. But and when you looked at the facts on the ground, it was completely different than what the general perception of the industry was. And so there was no money, there was no money necessary to, to do the business other than the, uh, the know-how and, the, and the, uh, uh, enough capital to actually option the land and then you know, lay out the money to buy it when you needed it. Well, so then I guess my question is, if, if, if uh, sales dry up or for whatever reason, they're not turning anything, where is the value of the stock then? Well, what you would, I, that's a good question. The question is, if you earn $10 a year for nine years and in one year you break even, what's your normalized earnings? It's pretty close to nine bucks. And that, that's the way I'd look at this one. So maybe I wouldn't use 10, but I might use nine. You know, my guess is earnings wouldn't even go to zero here. I mean, it may slow down. They may, you know, have two years of $4 earnings and then it goes back up. So that's the way I would look at it. All right, let me give you the uh, timing on this. This was November 2002. Admittedly, a good time to buy anything. For those watching on video, this is NII Holdings. The symbol is NIHD, also written by Charlie479, so you can look that up uh, on the Value Investors Club.
The last part, it says, uh, I'm just looking at number three, it says NII would trade at $2 if it were to achieve a five times EBITDA multiple. That should be $28. For some reason it got cut off. Okay, anyone want to go through this one? He kind of lays it out for us. Let's, let's go through it. This is basically Nextel in Mexico, right? Uh, it was over leveraged, went into bankruptcy, coming out of bankruptcy. So who wants to take me through this? He kind of lays it out one by one. We can discuss them. Joe? Um, I mean, pretty much what you touched on, it's a good business that had a bad capital structure. Now that they've come through bankruptcy, they don't have the debt to accompany the old business. He dives into the fact that they're, because of the direct connect, the business model is stronger than that of other wireless carriers, and further has strategic importance to Nextel. When you put that together, it's undercovered, and if it you know, received a valuation comparable to its results, or if he you know, grudgingly said to just other comps, well, uh, that's true. So let's go step by step what he said. Number one, he said under research neglected equity. All right, it came out of bankruptcy. People aren't following it. Um, number two, he, so, so it's a fertile place to look. That was one of the areas we might look because uh, the natural constituency, what happens in bankruptcy. Uh, other people, if, if all the debt turns to equity, the previous debt holders are generally banks and other insurance companies and places that don't really want to own this debt. So they get equity back. They usually sell it. So there's an opportunity there. Obviously, there are a lot of vulture investors who buy this up uh, before it actually you know, starts trading. But here's one where that's all taken place. Stock is trading at $10 a share. It's November 2002. It's already come out of bankruptcy. You have all the facts. You have all the documents. So, number one, uh, you're looking at a neglected area, whether it's spinoffs or bankruptcies, that's kind of interesting. Low valuation. Um, two good things about that. Low valuation is good. 2.8 times EBITDA sounds potentially cheap, depending on what CapEx is, and we can discuss that in a second. Um, but this is my favorite. The valuation isn't easily discerned from the public filing, so I will post the details in a follow-up post, which means that the numbers weren't that straightforward. You had to reconstruct them. All the numbers were available because he reconstructed them. But it wasn't clearly saying, oh, this is 2.8 times EBITDA. What he first did was say, gee, this is a complicated situation. Sometimes there's fertile ground here. And I'm going to go look and figure out where is it trading. So that's another reason why he was able to find this one, because it wasn't clearly yelling out 2.8 times EBITDA. But you're all good enough uh, at reading balance sheets and income statements, if you sat long enough with this thing, you would figure out what it's trading for, and that would be the first question you're asking for. Ask for. What are normalized earnings? What, or what is it earning now? Then maybe you go to what are normalized earnings. So sort of hidden. The, the earnings are sort of hidden. You have to reconstruct them, and that's great when there's a very complicated situation. Uh, I like that because the earnings power is mass. Maybe it's overpriced. Maybe it's underpriced. But in this case, 2.8 times EBITDA sounds pretty darn cheap. All right, then he talks about sort of the Warren Buffett moat, saying, look, they own the spectrum rights. All right, they own the rights to the, uh, the, wireless, uh, uh, the wireless licenses that allow them to operate uh, this service. Um, and they also own the rights in uh, four other countries in South America. Um, number four, differentiated wireless offering. Why is that good? Anyone want to explain what Nextel does? It's basically a
Right, and I'm just guessing that if the phone services aren't as great in, in, or as established in, in Mexico and some parts of South America that you know, having that feature might be, might be pretty good to have. Um, so in any case, they have a differentiated offering, and he points that out, so that's a, a positive. Uh, so the capital structure is fixed. Uh, most of the debt was converted into bonds, or a lot of the debt was converted into, a lot of the bonds, 2.4 billion in bonds were converted into equity. So you know exactly, uh, you know, what their debt requirements are going to be, and most of the debt was converted into equity. No, I'm sure they, they write it down to some level that they, they think it's worth. Um, and basically what happens is they, the previous owners of those bonds now have ec own equity. That $2.4 in bonds now own equity. And then you can figure out the EV uh, from how much current debt there is. And what he's saying is, is that... Uh, Uh, the a this is trading at 2.8 times, and they're saying the average of the traditional wireless carriers is 6.7 times. Um, he's also saying that, um, you know, these guys may have a better, more differentiated service than some of these other guys. You could argue that one way or the other, but it's probably not worse. Um, so he's even being more conservative, taking a 30% discount from the comps. He comes out with $28, and the stock's at 10 so that's kind of interesting. Um, I'd say that's very interesting. Um, now, when you do your comparable, comparable analysis, uh, I'm sure there are reasons he used EBITDA. I don't really want to see EBITDA unless there's really no CapEx. I just want to reiterate that. Uh, but for comparable analysis, if there's a comparable amount of CapEx uh, and, and there's um, or a comparable amount of maintenance capex. It's 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 one of the uh, it's one of the metrics you can use, uh, but you have to give me a good reason why when, if you use it. All right. Then now he's saying I'm not even including in this valuation because it's not earning money right now. The rights to these Brazil, Mexico, Peru, and Argentina, uh, and uh, it owns wireless assets in Chile and Philippines. So that's just stuff that falls off the back of the truck. Extra value. That's probably difficult to value, but you know there is some value there, and I bet you, um, if you if you spend a little time, you'd probably come up with a minimum valuation for those for those rights. And he's just ignoring that. Uh, and then number eight, he says, proven strategic importance to Nextel. Okay, in other words, Nextel has been financing these guys because if you have Nextel in the U.S. and you go to Mexico or you go to South America, it doesn't work. All right, they're saying there's value to Nextel to keep it in there, and Nextel's actually plowed in a lot of money to keep these guys afloat when they were in bankruptcy. So that's a very good sign that, that this isn't going to be allowed to fade away. Um, so he has a few catalysts. They all make some sense to me. Emergence from bankruptcy. Uh, it's going to move to NASDAQ. And then... The traditional valuation is just ridiculously cheap. It appears to be ridiculously cheap. So who would have bought this one? Yeah, we didn't buy enough when I read this on the Value Investors Club. So we have to read it more carefully. We learned to read it more carefully um, after this, although we did buy some. Now I'm going to show you this. Um, now it says, eh. You guys watching on video. It says it went to uh, 80, but here's the thing. Um, one, one thing this chart doesn't say is that it, this actually split three for one uh, in between. So the stock. All right, since I dropped this, this went from 10 to 240 because it split three for one. Uh, 
which is pretty amazing. I happen to know the author. Sold it around 60, but that's still six for one. That's still pretty good. <laughs> so, all those who raised their hand were correct. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll do one more or two more, depending on how patient you are. Maybe I'll just hand one out. All right. Now, We'll switch things around and change the name, but keep the author. And it's not me, unfortunately. This is still Charlie 479. Uh, no, I really care about your valuation skills. Um, you know, I think I told you last time that uh, one of the reasons that um, one of the reasons why it's good to learn all different market caps and special situations. And you know, I showed you that book last week. I didn't bring it in again, but you know, it was written in 1959, I think, uh, on special situation investing. <laughs> And I thought the great thing about that was this stuff has been out there for years and years. And uh, what generally happens is that people who get good at this stuff um, move on to larger capitalization things because they get wealthy. And uh, so they can't look at some little things. So what that does is allows new people to keep uh, looking at the smaller situation. And so there's always a natural evolution of people who get good at this moving up in market cap, and there's always the smaller market caps that aren't worth their time anymore. They're available for you guys to make your fortune, so, you know, they move out of your way. This is June 03.
You know, for you on video, I'm sorry, uh, Sportsman's Guide, but you can fast forward to get here. So look up Sportsman's Guide, S-G-D-E. Okay, anyone want to outline the thesis here? Guess you're not done yet. Yeah, sure. Pretty neat thesis. I mean, very straightforward. I mean, it's very clear to you. So we see an underlying pattern to each one. We'll go over this a little bit more, but basically, what the so what were they doing before? They, they were mailing it to so regular mail, um, and basically that has longer lead times. And obviously, the internet costs more. Costs more to send out all the catalogs. Right. So. It's a very straightforward thesis. Stock is cheap on current earnings. You have uh, loyal customers. You have, so wh why can't, you know, when you go to the internet, you can buy anything though, right? I mean, you have more competition too on the internet, right, to shop for this stuff. Um, I, what, it, wh Right. He, he put it down here where he said operating cash flow, right, minus capital spending. He, he said it's 4.85 times that. Oh, why is it cheap here? Uh, well, it was June 2003. I think uh, since that time, stocks have run about 80%, so probably a lot of other cheap stuff out there is the only thing I can, I can suggest as to why this wasn't cheap. And I remember looking at this. And I immediately liked it, um, but it wasn't, uh, it didn't stand out incredibly from some other opportunities also. So we did, we did buy this one, but it wasn't clear uh, that this was super cheap. I think another reason why is this is a small cap. It's a relatively small cap. There's not a lot of uh, stock out there. Uh, it only, this whole company had 180 million in sales. Um, so not, not a big company, I guess, would be my other explanation for why. But the thesis is very clear here, right? I mean, they're migrating to the Internet, cheaper cost structure. That's not usual. Um, but we didn't answer the question is why wouldn't the Internet then provide more competition for their cheap goods? I mean, it's easy to find. I think one of the keys that they mentioned here is that they're buying this stuff at such a low cost that what they're offering to sell it for is cheaper than any other the competition can Right, it's a closeout business. So, um, you know, one, f not fear I'd have at a low enough price, I'd buy anything and it looks like there's good growth prospects and I agree with that. They're sourcing uh, closeouts. Um, anyone see a problem with that as far as growth? Allison? Um, well, they're buying a lot of, uh, you know, eBay is not the most efficient way to sell things and maybe there's one item available. If you're buying, you know, a thousand of whatever and you have these customers who are already interested and they know where to look on the web, I, I'm not particularly worried. I wouldn't be particularly worried about that, but I would be worried uh, from a growth perspective. Yes. Sort of those, those 
down so they can send an email out like, within the same couple days that they actually buy the product, lower their inventory only costs as opposed to the way they actually print and then mail the catalog. So I would think that would get better for them over time. Right. Now, in this particular case, because we're very small, that's one of the benefits. You know, it's 180 million in sales. You probably could grow a lot, and you have you have a database and people who are interested in the products you show, and and you have a nice niche. And so I'm not worried about that. But um, who's heard of Sims? Have you ever heard of Sims, the retail store, or Lomans? Well, those are places that started out as closeout. Uh, and you know, people used to go there and shop for bargains because they got great closeouts. And then they started expanding, and then uh, they started filling in their inventory with cheap, cheaply made stuff. <laughs> um, just originally cheaply made. So before it was high quality stuff at cheap prices, and then it turned into low quality stuff at cheap prices as they expanded because there weren't enough closeout things. So I think that was the flaw that I found in both those models, both Sims and Lomans, when they when they rolled out. And so that would be something I'd be wary of here because their model makes sense if you're really good at sourcing closeouts. And per I don't know how fast that might grow. I think at 180 million, they're probably pretty small. And maybe you don't have to worry about it for a number of years. Yes? I'm sorry? Do you? Well, I think the Buyers Club is really just for a small portion of their, their group, and they do get special offers as opposed to the wide offer. So you, you would still might want to pay for those special offerings. I mean, these are really sportsmen, I suppose. Cheap sportsmen, I guess. So there's a certain group of those. So wouldn't worry quite as much about that. Yeah. I was just curious as to, as to know why it seems like they're cannibalizing themselves by having this bargain outfitters.com site. Anything that they can't sell originally, uh, because it's the stuff they couldn't sell. So, uh, so I guess um, bottom line is most of the stuff probably sells, and so you get the less desirable stuff on Bargain Outfitters. You may never see the more desirable stuff if you don't buy it from the original. Is I'm guessing. Is that the same kind of concept that happens today uh, at retail? People walk in beginning of the season, first day, is that hundred bucks, four, three weeks later, four weeks later, thirty down fifty percent. Well, based on your th theory, then I guess that should have come home to roost long ago, and there would be no one shopping at first, and apparently there are. So uh, maybe people don't like buying shorts in December or, you know. Actually, it's a, it's a, for most retailers, it's a huge boom to have that because it helps them liquidate inventory that they just wouldn't be able to get away. So you get, um, you know, apparel makers that have online sites where they can liquidate their apparel and turn them into cash. And, you know, I can think of a shoe company that has the store so it can control how it's down uh, as opposed to having them just you know, marketing the bargain bin at all normal supermarkets. So I think it's actually an effective way to, to give you another outlet for distribution. Good answer. Any other questions on this? Well, we, we know uh, which way it went, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't have picked it. Um, so this one is now 27 a couple of years later up from 10. The only thing about that, or it's 26, the only thing about this also is that it's split three for two. So I guess it's closer to 40. So, you know, I guess they continue to do well on the internet. So quite, um, so this guy, same guy, right, wrote up all three things. So he's probably pretty good. Now, he, he did write up a total of five things, I think, you know, that, that we have on the board. They all, they all did uh, well. I'll, I'll hand you another one. We don't have to read it in class. You can read it at home. A uh, more recent one that he wrote up in July. Um, just because the thought process is so clear, he lays out point by point by point. It's very clear what the thesis is. Whether you agree with it or not or whether there's issues, he's writing up the basic thesis 
uh, that he's investigated and feels comfortable with the questions you're asking, and he's only trying to lay out the basic thesis. And so as you, um, you understood the real estate one, right? He said they're buying options now. They're not laying out money. They're pre-selling stuff. It's a different perception than people have of that business, right? The next one is coming out of bankruptcy, um, very cheap on valuation. They have a franchise that uh, is a little differentiated uh, from everyone else, has support from the parent, basically, the, uh, the, the main supplier, and um, you know some growth opportunities in you know stuff he's not even valuing four or five different things so you know you see the thesis here sportsman guide very simple things are changing to the extent that they can migrate it, oh and there's um, in the first case there was a huge buyback of stock you know in the real estate business in sportsman's guide they have free cash flow and then now they can finally you know no debt and and some cash and they can finally <laughs> buy back some stock so another important aspect is well you can earn all the money you want, but if management's going to piss it away, you don't get, you don't get to keep it. And uh, here, if you know ahead of time that they're going to be buying stock back with it, then that's nice to see. So what they're going to do with the earnings, what, what, you, what your perception of management, at least in what they're going to do with the earnings, is very important also. So the underlying themes are very straightforward, and I don't expect, you know, these are, these are home runs, obviously, and so I'm not expecting your first paper, only your second to be these good. Um, but it just tells you, the, the thesis, you know, you can all understand the thesis. If he sat down with you, or wrote this out, or you got to sit down and ask a few of the questions, right, of Charlie 479, um, you'd all walk away saying, I got to buy this thing, right? He's done the work. I mean, you, you, see, you know it when you see it. And I think w what it is when you're doing it is, uh, wh when, you're, when you're learning this business, as you do this over a period of years, you'll know it when you see it. I mean, these are particularly good, but when you see something this good, you'll recognize it. Oh, I remember that from a few years ago, and that's a setup. Or is this a good risk reward? I think it's going to go up 20% over the next year, uh, but there are all kinds of issues that I'm not sure of of the business. They're not like this. So the more things you look at that worked out, and the more things you look at that didn't work out uh, for various reasons, there really is no substitute for that experience, but even without a lot of experience, if I had Charlie 479 come up here and describe these investments, and I said at the end of the presentation how many people would buy that thing, I would assume, you know, especially in these three, three examples, that everyone's hand would have gone up, yet they're available. So, you know, th this kind of analysis would say, you know, it's not worth thinking any more about the efficient market theory. I mean, this is, you know, I, 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 picked, I, I, I picked the same guy. It's not like, oh, I picked the best thing. This is the same guy who has, the same investor who has a certain thought process that you would probably bet on <laughs> in the future uh, that he understands how to do analysis and, and uh, look at businesses and and do some basic valuation. None of this was taking something to the 37th decimal point. This was all like, this is so cheap, right? If I'm even close to right, this is so cheap, I'll make money. And if, and if I'm not right, it's going to be hard for me to lose money. So th that's under, those are all underlying thing, themes to this. And I, um, the whole construct of you know, what's been taught generally in business schools over the last 40 years about efficient markets and beta. I know you, you're in the value investing program, so you've already dismissed that already. But it just seems, it just seems so ridiculous when you can uh, look for opportunities. And it's the same guy time and time again. And speaking of the same guy, um, you know, second part of the class where you get to win your uh, Warren Buffett cartoon book um, is the same guy who time and time again has a certain theme, certain things that he looks for in investments, certain qualities of a business that, he, that he's looking for that, that can make you money. And the funny thing is we're going to talk about Buffett, and I'm sure you're all sick of, you know, I mean, you, you all feel you know, pretty knowledgeable about Buffett. But I can tell you this, as many times as I read it, I keep saying, oh, yeah, I have to remember that um, every time I read it. So the more that you pound, and I've been doing this for, 
you know, unfortunately a long time, or fortunately, whatever. <laughs> and by the way, if you really, really get good at this, you know, let's say 20 years from today, you may have the opportunity to do what I get to, I'm getting to do this weekend, which is uh, drive to uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania with my daughter, Melissa, to stay at the Holiday Inn and go watch a soccer tournament. So if you play your cards right, you might have <laughs> those kind of opportunities. Anyway, um, <laughs> why don't we take just 10 minutes and come on back and, and think of some good questions for Warren Buffett. Okay. Um, we had a couple good questions during the break, so whoever was asking, you want to help me out? Sure. Uh, the question was about management. Uh, they, they didn't really talk about you know, what the managers were like. What was their track record over time? Um, you know, right, like the managers of the companies. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's an important point. I think, you, you know, for instance, in NVR, uh, management owned a huge stake in the company. and, and uh, there was probably no need in the short area to talk about management because from their actions, you could tell that they were very shareholder oriented. They had bought in half the stock over the previous five years. Uh, they had uh, moved to a model that was a high return on capital model with low risk. Um, they'd been doing all the right things that hopefully you would like to do. So one way you can check out management is to see what they've actually done. And that's usually the best way. Um, <clears throat> actually, I have... Uh, it, it, you know, it's very valuable to meet with management also. It's just not one of the things that I'm particularly good at. Um, I, I started doing this a long time ago, and I used to meet with managements, and I always used to come away saying, that guy seems smart, that guy seems smart, that guy seems smart. And um, So I wasn't very good at picking, you know, who really was going to be doing a good job, but I was very good at picking based on what their track record was, what the numbers looked like, what they were doing, how they were acting. Uh, how they were incented um, with, um, you know, how did their option situation or their amount of stock they own compared with how much money they were getting paid each year. And that's probably the most important thing that I look at. Uh, you know, what they're doing, of course, because you can still be incented the right way and, and be not that bright, okay? Um, but if I think you're pretty bright and doing the right things and you're incented the right way, that's the types of things I was looking for. And NVR, it was sort of a non-issue. They were, you know, had a huge stake. I think Sportsman Guide uh, Insiders had a, a decent-sized stake, and uh, NIHD, the uh, next hell, uh, was coming out of bankruptcy. So it was easy to see how they were incented. But there, it was just super cheap. So uh, it wasn't quite as important because it was it was really a special situation. Um, but it would be important to look at how management was incented anyway. But in that particular case, it wasn't particularly relevant. Um, it's a good question. Uh, the other question is, what is Charlie 479 doing now? Um, he, he, <laughs> he, he was working at a large firm at this time, actually doing uh, bankruptcy, uh, mostly distressed investing. That's why he was able to post uh, stock ideas uh, at the time. And now he runs his own fund. Um, well, what I said uh, basically was what a, uh, we set up the Value Investors Club. How many people have looked at it now? Are you all looking at it? It's, it's such a great learning tool. Um, we didn't really set it up for that reason. We sort of set it up for uh, finding ideas. If we could find one or two ideas a year, gee, that would be a great, great thing. And what we ended up doing is uh, having something that we call it sort of American Idol for hedge fund managers, where we're actually uh, Finding really smart people over a period of years really you get to know. Uh, yes, we helped him. <laughs> <laughs> Not being stupid after a few, uh, <laughs> after reading a few of these, uh, I figured. Uh, but in any case, uh, he would have he would have done it with with or without my help. But uh, I'm glad we were able to find him. But uh, there's. There's a lot of smart people out there. There's a lot of good things being posted. Not all of it's great. You really have to be picky. Um, 
but what a great learning tool. And also, just even if there's a bad post written up and there's a message string afterwards, bringing up, you know, highlighting all the, the, the issues. Uh, I think that's very important. You know, we were reading about maintenance capex. You know, I just handed that thing out. That was, you know, that was a jewel. And you know, it's just uh, that guy. I think used to be a plumber. And uh, the guy who wrote that up actually, you know, had a plumbing contracting business or whatever that he sold out, and now he invests the money. But he, his background was being a plumber. So, yeah. <laughs> Sure. I think I said what I said in the book about bankruptcies was basically that uh, the most interesting ones to me are good businesses that were over levered, or that there was one business good, one business bad that drove them in, or you know, one time event, or something of that nature. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, we talked about high returns on capital and 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 looking for good businesses and. You know, I would tend to look for that to see if the, the nature of the business is good or part of the business is good. You never know how it's going to come out of bankruptcy. One part may be sold off and another. Actually, uh, back, in the, uh, back in the 80s, uh, you know, leverage buyouts were really hot. You know, true story. Um, and uh, I was very jealous that th these guys, and at the time you could probably put, uh, put up a dollar and borrow nine was usually uh, the way you could do these things. And you know, the risk reward looked good and there were a lot of guys doing this and I was really doing investing and I always wanted to be involved with them. one. So one of my friends came to me with a deal and the deal uh, it was a very small leverage buyout. Uh, it was actually uh, uh, being uh, brokered by Drexel Burnham and they did all the financing and the way they did the financing was we had to, as equity holders we had to put up a million dollars uh, and that was you know a bunch of us so it wasn't a lot of money uh, for each of us but it was a small deal so it filtered down to my friend uh, we were all in our you know about your age and uh, and filtered down to my friend and we only had to put up a million dollars and they were going to lend us $26 million. So it was a $27 million purchase price. Uh, now, one warning sign that we should have seen uh, was that the seller uh, was a leveraged buyout shop uh, that had obviously goosed the numbers, you know, the year before they sold. They were actually, it was, they made baking pans uh, for, uh, you know, well-known baking pan company, as well-known as baking pan companies can be. Uh, and they made the baking pans for Twinkies and Wonder Bread and, you know, all kinds of different things. And it was kind of an interesting uh, business just to see something that had been around for so many years. Uh, if, if you went to the uh, factory in Chicago, the, the little office outside the factory had about a typing pool of about 20 typewriters and they were manual typewriters from about 1928 or something like that. So, you know, little tip-offs we should have probably seen uh, about this business. Anyway, <coughs> it went bankrupt within I think about six or nine months of after we purchased it, you know, being shrewd due diligence uh, types that we were at the time. And what happened in bankruptcy was that we were able to I, the, the, the Drexel bonds, the subordinated bonds that were issued went to zero, you know, were really worthless. Uh, the business had basically imploded, you know, <laughs> at that time, you know, really was never as good as when we bought it anyway. And the bank was on the hook, I think, for about, uh, it, we still owed the bank about $10 million. Uh, you know, even after wiping out the subordinated debt. And so we sold off one of the small businesses for about $3 million. And then since no one else wanted this business, the same guys who sort of took it into bankruptcy, we, we were able to buy the assets, uh, the remaining assets that we had just paid $27 million, less the $3 million we sold off stuff for, for about $6 million. And we ended up, when all was said and done, we ended up doubling the money, original money that we put in, even though it was a complete disaster. And 
you know, so a lot of crazy things happened in bankruptcy. The, the business changed significantly, uh, meaning it was much worse than we thought. We sold off a piece of the business. There was one remaining piece of the business that we thought was pretty good that we paid, uh, that, that we were able to get for $6 million, and, and we ended up making a little bit of money in the thing. But uh, in bankruptcy, lots of things happen. The business changes. There might be two or three businesses. One or two may be sold off or liquidated. The remaining business may be totally different than, you know, the look of the remaining business may be totally different than what, what you originally got. So anyway, that was a long diatribe about my uh, first foray into leveraged buyouts. Anyway, so I stick to investing um, in public markets. Um, So I'm going to play, uh, you know, along the lines of Charlie 479, where he is uh, has some talent, let's say, and and despite the efficient markets being efficient, uh, he he's able to to make money. Uh, so we have another investor, uh, Warren Buffett, who also uh, has been able to do that, and he has a few things to teach us. And once again, you know, I want at least a question from everyone, and then I'll let you know who wins the the cartoon book. Um, so I'm, I'm open for questions. I have a bunch of topics I want to cover, and if we don't, I'll, I'll go over them. But uh, you know, as you read through Buffett's work again, do you have any particular questions? If he were here today, what would you ask? And I'll try to answer them best I can. Alex, got any thoughts? I mean, one of the questions that I would ask as look at you know, the size of the pool of money that you have to invest is bigger and bigger. And I mean, clearly in the past few years, you've had more and more moving towards businesses that are still very good businesses, but the discount is not as big. Where do you see that going forward? I mean, like, where do you see that continuing and what do you think the danger, the biggest danger is that you way of investing? Well, I think that's a good question, and I, I think... Uh I think Buffett's answered it a um, number of different ways. I think, uh, I don't know, in the copy I had on page 233, a uh, famous line he has is, a fat wallet is the enemy of superior investment returns. And uh, I think that's true. I don't think any of you in the room have to worry about that quite yet. Uh, you know, and Buffett has said, you know, if you're expecting me to earn 15% a year going forward, you know, that's perhaps unrealistic, even though he's been able to do quite well. Uh, it does get harder, and it gets harder. Uh, you know, e you know. There's a, a big difference. I think what Buffett has said was that if you gave him a million dollars, he could earn 50% a year still. You know, by looking at, you know, being able to look at a whole slew of different situations, he can look at 10,000 situations instead of just a thousand at most of the size companies that now he has to buy to make a dent in his portfolio. So we should all have such problems, but I, I do think. There's a difference between running 5 million, 50 million, 500 million, 5 billion, 50 billion. I think uh, the difficulty ratchets up. I think uh, unbelievably now, I think most of the bargains that we are seeing are in the large caps. So you could actually, and this is, this is probably unique to, to when I've been investing, uh, for however long I've been investing, is that I think the biggest bargains are in the large cap stocks. Um, not saying I own any of these, but the, the sort of the Walmarts, um, the American Expresses, the you know, you know, there's numerous large McDonald's. It is just a, a large amount of large companies that uh, you know have opportunities that are relatively cheap, and I would say the difference between when we were looking at some of these things, the end of 2002 and 2003, the small caps have run over 100% since that time. Uh, the large caps have been going down for five years. And so now, even though they were overpriced, it doesn't really mean much if they were way overpriced then. But right now, there are better bargains. I would say lower rates of return than what you would traditionally expect from small cap bargains, but higher quality businesses that you're able to buy at you know, relatively cheap prices. So I wouldn't expect, you know, Huge, huge returns, but I expect very good returns given the risks that, that are being taken. Steve?
Well, he's worth $40 billion himself. So, <laughs> you know, I don't know who he's giving it back to. Uh, you know, I guess he'd rather run it than somebody else. Uh, it's sort of a, it's a partnership that he has with his shareholders, and he's running their money along with his. And so I don't think he, you know, um, he does have a benefit in, in size right now, for instance, he doesn't really look for stocks all that much, although if he finds a large cap stock that's cheap, he'll still buy it, but he's really looking to swallow whole companies now, which is at the stage he's at, given the amount of money that he has to run. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that's a realistic opportunity for him, given the fact that he, he's owned so much of the company. He did say he's going to consider returning cash to shareholders if he can't find something relatively Right. Well, right. It, it, it really depends. Uh, you know, a lot of his money is run through insurance companies. And so if he can have, uh, if he can create, in other words, if, if he can write insurance and break even, okay, in other words, his loss ratio is 100 or less, then his borrowing costs are next to nothing. And so his cost of capital is very low because he, he basically has all these insurance businesses. And so his hurdle rate might not have to be 15%. In other words, because of sort of the leverage of using the insurance companies, even if he takes investments that are earning 10 or 12%, he's adding a huge amount of incremental value to the equity stake in, in the firm if he can put it to work at that level. And I would guess that he's not returning any money any time soon, I think. Uh, I think that he, he'll always find something uh, to put it to work in to beat his cost of capital, which I think varies from zero to three or four percent. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't see that happening, but you, you can give me a call if it happens. Yes, Allison. Well, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the Walmart story, although I know they have a lot of international opportunities where they're expanding. I think they can still expand here. Um, and so I think, you know, when I, when I briefly looked at their uh, growth opportunities for the next, you know, five years, I think they had enough. Uh, if you have a, if you use a dividend discount model, uh, it doesn't take, the, you know, when Rich Pizzino was here, there are almost no companies that grow 15 or 20 percent a year ad infinitum. You know, there are very few that can do it over a 10-year period. Um, and you don't really need that growth anyway, because any, if you throw it into any dividend discount model and say, you know, in perpetuity we're going to grow 10 percent a year, uh, you get some ridiculously high P.E. ratios that, that uh, are justified. And you know, even growing over a long period of time at 5%, you, you can have a pretty high valuation. Uh, you can justify a pretty high valuation. But stocks keep it up and they can grow. Right. I mean, there's natural growth in the economy. Let's say GNP grows 2 or 3% a year. Throw on some inflation. You have some growth there. And then if they can grow incrementally 2 or 3%, you're, you're getting up to decent size growth rates. So, yes. It's not the same as any of these things that Charlie 479 wrote up. Uh, and that's why I was saying the large caps might, um, well, it's an important concept because if you say, listen, I can see over the next five years uh, Walmart growing its value at 15%, you know, and then goes to a slower level, you know, a lower level. Uh, if people perceive that and there are limited places to put your money when you can you only invest in a 10-year bond at four and change percent or even if we use our hurdle rate which is six percent uh, you know people may discount that back and say I'll take an eight percent return and, and you may get a big chunk of this this year you may you may earn 30 or 40 percent on your money if you're following this if you're saying if if a stock will go from 10 to 20 in five years right which is about 
uh, roughly a 15 percent, 14 percent annualized return. Okay, and you're competitive. You're you're competing with six percent annual returns, or and you and someone figures out that they think it is going to be worth 20 in a few years. You the stock may move to 13. In other words, in the first year, they may say, look. 13 to 20 in four years is still a good rate of return, better than I can get elsewhere. Okay? So a year from paying 10, even though you think it's going to grow 15%, you, in your first year of holding, you made 30%. Because the market now agrees with you that, hey, this is going to be worth 20 in five years. Remember we discussed this? And so therefore, I, I can front load a lot of my profits in the first year or two as soon as people realize what I realize. So this is a way that you figure out that it can only, you know, increase in value 15% a year or 14% a year, which is really what this is, yet you can still make 30% or, you know, 40% over two years or a year and a half or something like that because people realize what you saw even though the growth rate is significantly lower in, in increase in value. So it depends what discount you're getting. It's important to keep in mind when you're making your projections that it, whether you have a catalyst that you think everyone will see uh, what you see now, the catalyst may be a year from now even though your valuation work is done three or five years out. So if it's discounted back, you, you can make that money. Um, you don't sometimes need a catalyst. Just say, listen, they're going to earn that money. The catalyst is they came through with the earnings that I expected. And, and you can get, get make the money that way. Adam? Uh, back in the day before your uh, circle of confidence was so expansive, um, what are the steps that uh, you would take to really learn an industry? Uh, well, if you're asking Warren Buffett as opposed to me, uh, I would. Uh, <laughs> uh, Warren Buffett does have. Uh, very significant circles of competence in, you know, financial stocks, in, uh, in, in all kinds of businesses that he can really understand uh, over time. Uh, and I think the way you, you get that is really by researching them, under, you know, picking businesses that are simple that you can understand. He, he's kept away from technology uh, specifically because he doesn't understand where it's going. He doesn't understand what's it going to look like in five years. Intuitively, he doesn't get that. Now, if you listen to Bill Miller, has anyone heard him speak? Around here? So it's a great opportunity to hear Bill Miller. Bill, Miller's, Bill Miller said is sort of, I'm going to look at technology because most, because of what Buffett has said, uh, most value investors don't even look at technology stocks. So I'm going to apply value discipline to technology, try to understand as much as I can. And you know, there's a great opportunity there. So it's not Buffett saying value investors don't buy technology. It's that that's just not where he feels comfortable uh, projecting the future. And, and Bill Miller takes the other approach saying, look, a lot of, most value investors won't even look in these areas, and I'm going to try to buy cheap technology stocks. The only way I personally, Joel, would look at technology stocks in general is when we have cash situations where you're buying the technology almost almost for free and there's not a big burn rate and things of that nature. Um, if there's a technology I think I can understand over long periods of time, perhaps, um, but I haven't found that one yet. So, yeah, Joe. So is the real issue with circle of competence not the complexity of the business, but the complexity of trying to figure out where that business will be in X number of years? Well, if you understand the business, you can understand that you can understand where it's going in five years. There's so many different things, right? You can understand that there's no one who knows, right? So that's one thing. And if there's no one who knows, you have no business investing in it. Uh, so just understanding the business is one, is only one component. You can understand the business, and, and one of the practicalities of the business would be, you know, no one really can predict. It's, it's sort of, over a short period of time, I, ca I can't tell you where this, you know, I could say, gee, I'm finding a lot of cheap stocks out there. But I really can't tell you where the market's going to be in a year. <coughs> or if I did, I'd be being silly. Uh, because even if it's cheap now, it can get a lot cheaper over the next year. I can't really tell you where it's going to go. And if you don't know long term where uh, a business is going, then you really have no basis to invest. 
I mean, if, you, if you're buying something at even five times earnings, but you don't know where earnings are going, you know, they could have or, or go, you know, be down 75% uh, over five years, then you have no basis on which to invest uh, other than looking at hard assets and things of that nature. You know, what I was talking about is a technology company, which I know nothing about, yet I think management management's incentive is not to dissipate the cash they have on the balance sheet. It's selling at five dollars, it's got five dollars in cash, and it's got a business that's not burning money that may turn into something. You know, it's almost like a free option I might look at it, or inexpensive option. Um, and so there's different ways to approach it. So there are ways to, to, to make investments. There is a price that you might be interested in in almost anything, uh, even if there is uncertainty, as long as the uncertainty isn't, well, it's, it's you're going to have huge negative returns over a period of time. So it can be done. Uh, it's not usually what I look for. It's, it's usually simple businesses that I understand. Steve? Um, uh, I can't I can't answer for Buffett other than I think that he is an incredible intellect who will still you know will have a lot of horses running up there more than we do uh, and will not be deterred by more competition looking for the things that that he's doing. I, I don't think he's particularly worried about that. I mean, there are certain principles um, of it. He said, he said, it's really not IQ points, and I, I can vouch for that. It's not IQ points being good. It's really an attitude of how you look at, look at the world. Um, <clears throat> an answer for myself, uh, it's a big world out there. Uh, I, I would say these the unintended benefits of teaching, and this is my 10th year now, teaching this class. Um, you'd think I'd be better, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I would say that trying to explain what you're doing uh, is, is very, very helpful to me. Um, and, and trying to explain it clearly uh, has really helped my investment, my own investment skills, trying to explain it to someone else, trying to put it into words that someone else, what am I actually doing here? Why was that investment interesting? All those kind of questions are really very helpful to go over. And so it's really been a great, you know, it wasn't the reason I started teaching. I started teaching because I always wanted to teach and write, and so that's what I'm doing. But um, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a big, big world out there. There's, you know, trillions of dollars in market value in many different countries across the world. There's many opportunities and I think, you know, there's a, uh, for instance, I just, I just uh, wrote another book which I'll give you uh, when I have it in a, a little over a month. Um, and you'll probably read the book and say, why did this guy write this book? Uh, my partners asked that question too. Uh, but I will uh, tell you this, uh, and, and the book involves a study uh, that is very valuable and and the study involves doing exactly what I showed you to do which is buy stocks with a high earnings yield okay and buying stocks uh, with high returns on capital and combining those two and what happens okay so I provide a study in there saying gee you really probably shouldn't be doing much else because th this works out very well and it's not much different than all the value studies that have been out there for a long long time uh, you know there have been low PE studies, low price book studies, and things like that nature. And if you, and if you look at low PE studies, what you'll see is, uh, over the period that I test in the book is, uh, you know, let's say the market during that period was up about 10%. If you just pick the, the best 10% of stocks, uh, in other words, the cheapest 10% of stocks based on PE ratio, uh, you would have made 15% a year over the 17 years, last 17 years. If you picked the worst 10%, you would have made 7%. And 
And then if you go through the deciles, it's a straight line. You know, one beats two, two beats three, three beats four, you know, and that's a pretty big spread between best to worst. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why people don't do that. I mean, that's just, simple, that's just PE. That's not trying, right? That's really just not making much of an effort. Yet, you're destroying uh, pretty much almost every manager. The guy who walked in here and said, you know, he's beaten the market by 5% a year for the last 17 years, he'd be a famous guy that you heard of if he was running a fund. And he'd be coming in here saying, I'm great and this and that. And I'm telling you, I've been reading low PE studies since the late 70s, uh, saying they work, and yet, you know, starting in late 80s and doing this. Uh, this works. So, all right, well, that's a sort of an observation, maybe after the fact, but there have been all these tests. Why don't, why don't people? Why are they obsessed with growth if these are the facts? And you know, I, you could have had before I started the 17-year study. You go back the previous 20 years and have done the same study, or 20 years before that, or in any country, any stock market in the whole world. Okay, and you did this study, you get the same results. And it's been out there forever. So, you know, why aren't I worried that all of a sudden now everyone's going to be value investors or low PE investors? And this is just the simplest form, right? Without trying, this is not trying. Jordan. I think it's emotion. I think if you look at buying those really cheap businesses, usually there are reasons for it. A lot of times there's a crappy situation. And I think it's just, I don't know, I'll, talk, I'll say I, but I think a lot of it's we. We just feel better sometimes buying great businesses when they're a little bit more expensive. We don't have the discipline to just have the conviction to say, I'm going to buy all these businesses where there's, oh my God, there's the industry's falling apart or the management sucks or all this stuff. And it's, it's hard to just swallow it and just hit the buy button, I guess, all the time on those really cheap. Right. Well, true. Well, I have a couple of responses to that. Uh, one that's true. I mean, when Rich Pizzino was here, he said the first thing his clients ask him when he goes through his stockholding list is, don't you guys read the paper? That's the first thing, because everything, you know, there's something wrong with everything he owns, right? Apparently, I mean, but he was in here with Lear, and he said, look, it's, he just says, is it a permanent or short-term problem, right? That's how he analyzes it. And with Lear, he explained very specifically why, after doing the research, he decided, so Rich takes this one step further. He actually tries. He says, well, I'll start with the low PE list, more or less. Uh, but now I'm going to actually do some research and pick out of the low PE list you know, which, you know, which ones I actually think are short-term problems. And, and that's why. So that's, that's one reason. Yes, they're hard to, it's hard to do. However, it doesn't answer the question why this works in order. Right? Because it's, you know, every single stock can't be, right? There's 10 deciles, right? I'm pretty sure. So, um, <laughs> so you know, decile one did 15%, two did a little less, three did a little less, blah, 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 blah. So it sort of works that way. They're not all terrible stocks, and, you know, you can buy decile, buy decile two and maybe not throw up every time you walk out the house that you own these terrible things. So, not a full, who has I guess, but uh, before I, let's say, write a book or start teaching this stuff, I want to know. And so you're right in this sense that I'm not worried that everyone's going to adopt this low PE strategy and it'll ruin it for everyone. Um, because it's been going on for so long, it's been known for so long, it's been tested you know, 30, 40 years, every country, every, everywhere. And this is, this, like I said, this is not trying. Yes. You're saying, why does this work? Uh, I guess, but, but uh, my question is almost more, why does this continue to work? In other words, I understand why low PE investing inherently works. Uh, I'm, I'm more wondering why, since what you're saying is sort of the natural order of things, where there's reversion to the mean and you know, 
things that are doing badly get better and things that are doing well don't stay as well and they sort of collapse and if you buy this cheap it'll get better usually. I understand that's why it works. I'm, I'm not understanding why everyone doesn't do it because they know this. Well, I think that's right. I think that's part of that. Uh, what, what Haugen wrote was, if you're a big institution, uh, this is, you know, Buffett said, I'd rather have, uh, you know, a bumpy 15% than a, than a straight 12, okay? And some people would rather have the straight 12 or a straight 10 than a bumpy 15. And here, this is, these are kind of bumpy returns. Yes, over the full period, Decile 1 did do 15%, but there are huge periods, as we saw the cycle of value investing, where there could be three, four-year periods, sometimes longer, where it doesn't work. And then you say, oh, things have changed, people are doing it, whatever it might be. Um, so it's not just this always works. If it worked every year, it wouldn't work. It, it works most of the time, you know, over long periods of time. Um, so I think that's one good answer, that from an institutional standpoint, you can't live through the down, downturn. So it's a very hard strategy to follow. Still, you might be perplexed as to why because it continues to work everywhere, why more people don't do it yet. I also think even though everyone kind of knows that, that strategy, there's a perception that the 50% is riskier, even though like from a purely statistical basis, you guys don't do this, but I think that the idea is that there's always a risk of 50%. I think that's true. It, it is perceived that way. It's just that there's been so much proof, and so you know it just keeps happening. Uh, You know, I, I mean, I, I think we're going back to the question of why I'm not really worried. I mean, uh, that's what I'm trying to get back to. You know, why am I not worried that if I tell you all this stuff, you know, there'll be no more opportunities? I think on the margin, most stocks aren't priced based on someone doing a quantitative low PE model, uh, even though some people are. I think they're priced because someone says, this is terrible, I've got to sell my stock. And that's, you know, or next year or two is going to be bad. I don't want to own this in my portfolio because I'm an institutional manager and I've got to pick stuff that I think is going to do well because I'll be out of a job in two years if, by the time this thing turns around or before the market. So I know it's cheap, but I still got to sell it. Or if I'm an analyst at a firm, which I really can't understand the logic, but it's more like they're not going to do well next quarter, so this, therefore the stock is no good. They make that connection which, you know, the stock is not something I want to own, which there should be not that much correlation. You know, it takes price out of the analysis, but that's where a lot of bargains come. And, you know, if you were here a few years ago, um, I used to come in and, and bring in the analyst reports of, you know, I know this is only at six times earnings, but <laughs> next quarter is really going to stink, okay? And that, that's the analysis. You know, and so we're going to buy it when things get better. And there's many of those. By the way, we have a, a next week, we have, uh, we were talking about bankruptcy before. Uh, we have Matt Mark coming in. He's going to uh, go through, a, you know, he really is, uh, spends a lot of his time in the distress area. He's going to be talking about that. Uh, we also have uh, my sister Linda is going to come in, and she's a retail specialist. And I'll give you the date on that. Um, <coughs> And she's going to uh, talk about some of those situations I was just talking about where analysts hate it, but it's clearly a low PE stock or appears to be a low PE stock, but things don't look good in the very short term. So um, we also have coming in, uh, these are all non sequiturs, but uh, uh, Eric Rosenfeld will probably be here on the 26th uh, to talk about uh, risk arbitrage and uh, activist investing. So we'll be able to see all those different types of areas. But in the meantime, you have Warren Buffett, so we got. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question as to exactly why you know, I'm not worried that I'm teaching this stuff. Uh, I think there's A, plenty for any, everyone, and B, this kind of stuff's been going on for years and years. Everyone knows it. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to have that outlook. It's hard to live through the tough times. 
Um, the, uh, the two examples I uh, give in my book um, are, I don't mention it by name, but there's a book that I recommended to you guys, What Works on Wall Street. Um, and in that book, uh, the guy goes back 40 years, uses CompuStats data to go test, you know, 30 or 40 different strategies, uh, and comes up with the one or two that are the best of all the strategies over 40 years. And what he did when he wrote this book in about, I think it was uh, 96 or 97 originally, uh, he started a mutual fund. Yes? Good, so that's good to know. But let me, uh, with regard to the story was, he did, I thought the book was very good. I recommended it to you. He did very good analysis. Uh, you know, it was very interesting to see what works and what doesn't over long periods of time. Uh, so anyway, so the guy who wrote the book, uh, he ends up setting up a mutual fund to take the best strategy that he had over the 40 years and start a mutual fund. And so what happens? Well. Uh, the first year, he doesn't do too well. The second year, he underperforms the market by 25%. <laughs> the third year, uh, he doesn't uh, compete well with funds of similar, you know, again, he doesn't compete well with similar funds. And so what he does is he sells his management company to somebody else. And what happens after that? Uh, so anyway, so, he, so it's three years. It hasn't worked out, okay? The thing that's done so well for 40 years, it hasn't worked out. Now, he wants to do some other venture, so he sells his business. But this is the guy who did all the tests. This is the guy who wrote the book, okay? He sells out. So what happens? The guy who buys the company continues the same exact formula. Over the next three or four years, it's one of the top performing funds, which makes it, he does so well during those three or four years that even including in the bad first three years, the guy is blowing the doors off of every other fund, is now has about $2 billion in this fund, yet the guy who wrote the book, who did all the tests, he couldn't hang in there, okay? Uh, you know, he had other things to do. I'm not, you know, I didn't even mention his name in the book because I thought he wrote a good book and I didn't want to, but he's the guy who did the work and he didn't make it. I mean, he, he sold out before it could turn around. And that's what happens to investors. Uh, I also tell the story of, uh, Actually, not by name, but you met him, Rich Pizzina. And the first four years in business, uh, he didn't do well. It was the late 90s. Uh, value was out. He was underperforming the market by huge amounts, doing exactly the kind of work he was doing here, buying stocks that were cheap the market didn't care about, you know, that were earning a lot of money, that were in good businesses, you know, all these great things. And he underperformed. And, uh, you know, we had a discussion. Uh, and, you know, he was going to keep doing what he was doing because he thought what he was doing was right, and I agreed with him. Uh, the only people who didn't agree with him were his clients. And so they basically pulled out most of his money during those four years. Uh, and you know the rest of the story. He continued doing what he was doing. He way outperformed everyone. Has now, you know, probably beaten, you know, he's running $15 billion, outperformed the market since inception, including the bad years, by 700 basis points a year. Um, you know, on huge amounts of capital, which is hard to do. You know, one of the top, you know, 1% of funds. Uh, and that's what happened to him when he was doing bad, but almost went out of business. And now there are, um, you know, out of hundreds of investors, there's four people who remain, you know, who stayed for the whole time. And I wrote up, I'm one of them, because I said I had to stay because I was his friend. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, basically, people don't hang in there. So to explain why this is really tough to do and why it keeps working, I think that's the good news. It's hard to do. It's hard to stick it out. And while it seems like the statistics are, I have much better statistics in the book, and I'll explain you know, just trying, you know, how trying does. Um, you, you can try more than just buying low PE stocks. Um, you can do incredibly well. And so the answer is why I'm not worried. Or, you know, when you can buy a reasonable bargain might not be 
a time that's easy for people to buy, or people might not value the quality of the business. In Buffett's case, a lot of times people won't value the quality of the business uh, or understand the quality of business as well as he does, you know, the long-term prospects, even if, if there's, especially if there's a short-term uh, blip. So anyway. Well, he must have been referring uh, to the fact that he's analyzing a business, so the stock price is not relevant. If the stock happens to be cheap relative to his valuation, then, then he would play. Also, over time, there's a great learning experience. You know, one of the other questions was, well, how do you learn an industry or whatever? Sometimes you find a company that looks cheap, and then you have to sort of learn the industry. You might not learn it well enough to feel confident, but you'll have to learn the industry. And even if the stock didn't end up being cheap, in other words, you look at a lot of things, right? You swing at one out of 20 pitches. Well, how do you even analyze the pitch? There's different levels of research that you would do to get there. If it continues to look interesting as you're going along, you keep working on it. At the end of the day, when you're, when you're doing your papers, you, you might pick something that looked like, here's my thesis. And I don't know what percentage, but at least 80% of the time, it's not going to be as cheap, or there's going to be some issues, or not going to understand it well enough or whatever it is, probably a lot more than 80% of the time. So your write-up will be, this is the valuation work I did. I thought it was going to be cheap for these reasons. It turned out it wasn't. Or it turns out my confidence level wasn't high enough. And this was the closest I could come up to the valuation, but I wasn't sure of these things or whatever it might be. Um, and that happens, but that's a learning experience. You learn that industry. And if that industry gets totally whacked at some point, you, you now have a basis to go evaluate it, and you're a little ahead of the game because you understand the industry a little better. So I think that's what Buffett's really referring to. He, he can only invest in, you know, if he looks at his value lines, which is what he looks at, right? Everyone know what a value line is? You know, so it's a little, you know, they, they put out little pages on each thing. And, and Buffett, by this time, after many years, he can only invest in, you know, 500 to 1,000 companies at most and, you know, that are big enough for him to invest in. And over time, he's gotten to know them. So now you just look for companies that are out of favor for a particular reason or have taken a hit in the short term. You've already done a lot of your research. You can act a little more quickly. You can act with a little more understanding. And I think so it always pays to do that research. Uh, and he's happy to evaluate a company and not worry about price because at some point it may come to him. The price may come to him. And I think that's why you know, it's valuable. And I think we've found some of our investments looking at one thing and then finding, hey, this company in the same industry is even cheaper or even better, you know, and while we were doing our comparison. And so you might like the industry. In other words, the whole industry may be cheap, but maybe you find a, even a better, better play by doing research on one of the companies that you originally found cheap. We'll also spend some time going through uh, some stock screens. Uh, they don't have to be particularly uh, sophisticated, um, but there are different ways to search for cash-rich companies or uh, low PEs or high returns on capital with low PEs or just sifting through things or even you can even look uh, some people look at this and actually if you look at the what works on Wall Street book uh, a lot of my friends still look at the lo uh, new low list okay and if, if you looked at the statistics that's the worst place to look on a momentum basis the worst place to look for stocks and uh, I don't use momentum in anything that I do, but the statistics say one-year momentum is very important uh, for uh, if it's good momentum, that's good for the stock. If it's bad momentum, that's bad for the stock. But five-year bad momentum, okay, in other words, if the stock's way down over five years, that's a positive sign. So one-year bad momentum is pretty much the worst place you could look. Five-year is one of the best places you can look. Um, I don't look at either. Um, and there's still plenty of bargains. I mean, if you're picking and choosing, a screen doesn't even have to be a good screen, but it could pick up a few things that you wouldn't have found otherwise as long as you're doing the research afterwards. It's just a, a new list to start, to start analyzing things. And we'll go through a bunch of those, and I'll give you some good screening products um, to use.
how do I look at cyclical businesses? Uh, me personally, I'm not, I, I tend not to look at cyclical businesses that often because they're not usually the greatest businesses. Uh, having said that, if I were trying to analyze a cyclical business, uh, what I would do is try to figure out what the normalized trend line is and pay a low. In other words, it's a good question. But if your earnings run like this, uh, you know, I try to figure out this is the normal earn earnings line and pay a low multiple to that. Uh, it's harder to project. They're not usually the greatest return on capital businesses, although sometimes they are. You know, if you have the right niche and everything else, and it just goes up and down. And you can, and, and there are sometimes big opportunities on the, on the down, downside of those cyclical businesses. You know, you could say also a perceived cyclical business, like uh, even though that real estate business, NVR, was, uh, you know, real estate cyclical, um, it, you can still come up, you can still have a business that has a, a model that's not going to suffer that much on the down side. Um, one of the things I wrote up in the book was uh, Wells Fargo. I don't know if you remember the leaps discussion of Wells Fargo, and we'll discuss the leaps later in the class too. You know, options and leaps for investing. And with Wells Fargo, uh, it, it was possible that they lost money. You know, in the '90s recession, it was definitely possible. We went through the numbers and thinking that a really bad year was they were earning $18 a year. The stock was at, I think, 70 roughly, and it, was, and it had earned $18 a year, $18 in the previous year. But there was a big bust in the California real estate market, and it was a question of how much losses they were going to take on their loans. Um, and we went through, even in a devastating time, that, yeah, they would lose $18, roughly, a share on those losses. And so their earnings, they had all these, you know, taking in deposits cheaply, lending out. They would have eaten through all their earnings for one year. And maybe they'd earn zero for one year. But that doesn't sound like going bankrupt. And if you're earning $18 in your normal year, if you have that kind of earning power, and every seven or eight years you earn zero, you can still value that business and say, uh, the way I chose to look at it was I say, that's pretty great. In your bad year, you don't lose money. In your good years, you make $18. That's worth a lot of money, certainly a lot more than 70 bucks. That was the hope and, and, and the way I looked at it. So uh, it depends how bad the down cycles are. Uh, it depends how leveraged the business is. You know, all kinds of things. Are they going to survive through the cycle? Might be a problem. You don't want to leverage up a, a very cyclical business. Um, Well, that's a good question. Um, when, you know, I, I don't try to trade because over the years I learned that I can't trade. I'm not very good at trading. So basically I do my valuation work and say, is this thing cheap? Okay. And if it's cheap because I think normalized earnings are close to 16 bucks and it's trading at 70, then I buy it. I don't say it's going to go down to 60, which it did. Uh, it, when the bad news comes out, because sometimes it doesn't. But the risk reward, you know, then it went up to 250. So the risk reward was like 10 down and 180 up or whatever. Um, and so you could be very cute trying to wait for those kind of things. And I learned that it doesn't pay to be cute. And, and, it, and it, it makes life very simple. You do your valuation work. If you can buy it at a big discount, that's going to get you a, a good rate of return. And, and part of what cons, uh, calculates to a good rate of return is based on experience, you know generally anywhere in the 20 to 30 percent a year range, depending on how risky it is, passes my hurdle you know, of doing well. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you get unlucky, and you only made 15 percent. Sometimes you were wrong, and then you don't make money. But if you're right, you'll eventually make money. And what I told you was right, that within two to three years, the market will agree with you if you did your analysis right. There's a little problem in that sometimes you're wrong. But if you are right, the market will agree with you in two to three years. And, that's, and you have to make sure that's a good enough rate of return over two to three years for you. Um, 
you can think of some more questions. Uh, I got to figure out who's going to win the book. Oh, okay, go ahead. I have. argument that maybe there's enough to do in the United States. I mean, there seem to be at times better opportunities to invest abroad, yet a lot of very smart, valiant investors uh, stick to the United States. What are the pitfalls that they, they feel they would run into uh, by investing in countries overseas? And off the cuff, it doesn't strike me as necessarily that difficult to uh, handle the accounting issues, so uh, mm -hmm. you can speak to that. Well, I'll speak for myself first. Um, this is the area we feel most comfortable, the US. So we traditionally, we, we've had a few international investments. We haven't traditionally done that. Each country has different laws, um, some different accounting standards. Um, sometimes there's currency risks that you have to decide whether you want to hedge or not. Um, you could always hedge those out if you think it's cheap. Uh, sometimes figuring out how the economy is going to do. I mean, even you know, Japan's a very developed nation, um, yet they had a completely different system. You know, back in the '80s when we couldn't figure out why stocks were priced how they were there, uh, it was very clear that there were a lot of different things going on in Japan. It was a much more fixed economy. It was. Uh, much more closed economy. It was more difficult to open competitors. It was more different government regulations. There was different shareholdings, um, different consumer behavior. Uh, it really was a different animal at the time. Um, it's not to say that you couldn't study it and understand what's going on there, and not to say that there's not many opportunities there, and many people gravitated there now where there's some there appears to be some value there. But you know, once you've mastered an area and feel like you know everything, uh, or at least you're very comfortable in a particular area, it's very hard to go, for me to go elsewhere. I would say that we're atypical of most hedge funds who've been doing this for a long time. Many people have branched out to do other things. Uh, one of the benefits we've had of staying small is that we don't need to look elsewhere. If, I, if we had billions and billions and billions to worry about, we might have to look for you know, greener pastures, and, and we haven't had to do that. And I think Buffett sort of has to look for greener pastures at this point um, for some of his money. I don't think it's ever going to be a big chunk of his money, and then that's another answer to your question. You know, It's not taking a big bet to put 5 or 10 percent of your assets in, you know, if 90 percent is still here. You don't really have to have a leap of faith to, to really do that. You just have to have a, you know, what perceived as a great opportunity. So there's plenty of opportunity out there, probably less efficient markets. Uh, there's just more to learn. And there's, there's sometimes cultural things and, uh, that aren't just legal issues or accounting issues and things of that nature that you might not understand quite as well as someone who's sort of grown up here for 25 or 30 years. So. There's nothing wrong with it. It's great opportunities elsewhere. All the stuff still works, the, uh, the P-E ratio stuff and, and everything else. So uh, that's it. Min. How do you handicap for uh, regulation? If you're looking at an industry that is not so regulatory issues, it could be a possible problem. Well, it's interesting. I, I would guess. Uh, just going back an experience that, that we've had, um, sort of uh, healthcare companies that re rely on stuff like Medicare or Medicaid, you know, how they get reimbursed for things. If they end up making too much money for a while, uh, they change the rules. And so you end up getting paid less. And you have to take that into account. You know, it's, it's sort of regulation that way. Um, so you, you would never assume outlandish returns. Although, if you look at, let's say, uh, hospitals, uh, you'd have to assess the situation. But the interesting thing about for-profit hospitals 
are that only about 15% uh, of hospitals are for profit and 85% are not for profit. Uh, you know, because capitalism tends to work, generally the for-profit hospitals are more efficiently run. Maybe not better medical care, can't really claim that, but they're more efficiently run. So that they can provide services for less than an inefficiently run hospital, which are many of the public hospitals. So since the reimbursement's the same from Medicare, uh, you may be able to maintain a decent rate of return on your income because if they're paying, uh, you know, they don't want all the public hospitals to go out of business, so they have to pay them enough to hang in there, which may be a very profitable amount of reimbursement for you. But those things change, and you have to take them into account, and, and sometimes it's very hard to do. So what happens when it's very hard, but it's predictable, but it's, you know, within a range? Then I just ask for a much larger margin of safety if I'm going to invest in an area that had some regulatory hurdles. Uh, when we talk about risk arbitrage, uh, huge and, and also takeovers, let's say insurance companies, it's very hard to take over an insurance company in a hostile way. It's very hard to take over a utility in a hostile way. And um, so therefore, uh, if you have a bad management, you may say, well, it's going to be tougher to oust them uh, than usual. You can't have the threat of a takeover in this industry, insurance, let's say, or utilities as much as you could in some other industries and therefore maybe the stock may even trade cheaper because there's less of a chance of changing management or changing the way things are going and you have to take that into account. So I would just say you don't check your, you don't check your brain at the door. You analyze the particular regulation or regulator in the environment at that time and take that into account. Uh, many times uh, if I can't, if I can sort of figure something out but not not as well as I'd like. I just demand a bigger margin of safety when I invest. Could you address the way the same as well, uh, I'll, gi I'll give you one from uh, Buffett's book. Um, and I'll give you one of uh, my worst investment. Uh, but Buffett talks about. Uh, Burlington Industries, okay, uh, many years ago. And he, uh, he was in the textile business too. Berkshire was originally a textile business. And, uh, you know, this is how he defines what is a bad business. Um, when, when he had an investment to look at, you know, to buy a new machine, right, in his textile business, or when Burlington looked at a new machine. There were all kinds of new looms and different ways to you know, make the fabrics, and gee, we'd cut costs by 40%. If, if you buy our machine, we'll cut costs by 40%. And so <coughs> they would buy the machines to cut their costs by 40%. And the only problem was what? Everybody else bought the same machine. And so all that happened was they laid out money for this machine, but they didn't get a return from the machine because there was no really barriers to entry to the business. There were a lot of not enough people going out of the business, uh, too easy to get back in the business, uh, and everyone had access to this technology. So it didn't have a brand name really, I mean somewhat of a brand name, but uh, what Buffett described was, gee, you know, we made coat, you know, linings to jackets. No one really cared that they ha owned a Berkshire Hathaway or a Hathaway lining. They, no one really cared. And uh, so they didn't really have that pricing power issue. And so each time they would do an analysis of a capital spending item, it looked like it was going to pay for itself over three years, and it never did. And so that was his definition uh, of a bad business. And so his worst investment was probably Berkshire Hathaway, the original, the original business. Uh, but he learned a lot from that. Um, my worst business was uh, investment uh, came about in a little different way because you know Buffett had taught me about that part. So I was really interested in a business that uh, you know earned high returns on capital, had a good franchise, and um, good growth prospects. What I perceived. So my worst investment was a company called Key Three Media, and we bought this very well. It actually started out as one of my best investments. Uh, 
it, it, um, there was a merger, and there was a company, I, I believe it was a merger, it was the bankruptcy or merger, and a spin-off came out called Key3 Media. And we were able, before the merger was completed, we were able to create, by going long and short of stock, we were able to create uh, stock in Key3 Media at $3. Now, Key3 Media uh, was a trade show. Uh, they, they own trade shows. One of their trade shows was called Comdex, which was the big computer show in Las Vegas. Um, it had a million square feet uh, of trade show. And the way a trade show works, I thought this was a great business. And just to save you my... Uh, well, save you from this. I won't save you from your own mistakes, but I'll save you from doing mine again. Um, I thought it was a great business, and it, and it truly was, because they owned Comdex, which was a computer show. They were renting out a million square feet in Las Vegas, and the way it worked was is that they rented the space for $2 a square foot, and then they, rated it, and then they rented it to the computer companies or the computer suppliers or whatever for $62 a foot. Oh, and they didn't have to own the space, right? They just rented the space, and if they needed another 200,000 feet because the show was taking off, they'd go rent another, there was enough space in Las Vegas, they'd rent another 200,000 feet for that show and cost them $2, and they'd rent it out for 62. And every year the price would go up. It was 58, 61, 62, whatever it was. Um, so no capital in the business. Pretty good margins, you know, no cost to expand. Right? I mean, the operating leverage was huge, right, as the thing expanded. Um, now, I was involved with this thing around uh, 2000 or 2001. And one of the things that was going on was the internet boom, you know, the technology boom. And you would think that, gee, uh, of course you're an idiot. You know, of course this is booming now and it's going to, the bubble is going to crash and no one's going to rent. But I outsmarted them because over those three years uh, before, the show hadn't grown at all during the whole internet boom. The show had stayed at a, roughly a million feet, had gone from, let's like, say, 950 to a million feet. You know, 950 to 9, then to a million feet. It was undermanaged. It was owned by some Japanese conglomerate. Uh, it was undermanaged. Um, and they brought in a new guy who had, had run Ticketmaster. Um, and had turned that, you know, in a 40 to 1 turnaround and you know very good manager and we met with him and he said you know these guys have done a terrible job we we got the show up from 900,000 feet to a million feet and we don't really care which of these technology you know we just care that technology grows which was very okay because every year we have 2400 exhibitors and 400 of them go out of business every single year but 400 new entrepreneurial guys set up shop and bless you and 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 as long as technology grows and computers stay popular, we'll, you know, be able to continue to grow. It doesn't matter if the players change. So that made a lot of sense to me. Um, the show hadn't grown because it was mismanaged. And the way he described uh, his business at Ticketmaster is, you know, they give you tickets for events, sports events and shows or whatever. And so he told us this very neat story where basically they used to sell the uh, advertising on those envelopes that you got your tickets in. So they used to sell the front of the envelope and they sell the back of the envelope and then they would sell advertising on the flap of the envelope. And then they'd sell advertising on the flap of the envelope. And then they'd sell advertising on the flap of the envelope. And pretty soon they had about nine flaps on every envelope that they were selling and they just kept selling the flap. And so when he got to Comdex, the guy said, you know, you know, we sold out the show with the three banners in the front of the hall. You know, we sold out. You know, we got, you know, $200,000 for each one, you know, advertising, you know. And he said, what do you mean the three banners are sold out? There are nine banners, you know. <laughs> and so he would sell, he sold six more banners, you know, for the same, for the same thing. So I figured this guy's pretty smart. So that's working out. Actually, these guys were doing a public offering. And just to talk about the Sears, we were, we took the risk that the deal wouldn't close. But we were long and short something. And the company was doing a public offering at $6 of some additional shares of Key3 Media after the deal was done, OK, after the spinoff was done, pre-merger. In other words, there was a merger. They were going to spin off a piece of the business, Key3 Media. At the same time, 
they were going to do a public offering to raise a little more money for Key 3 Media at $6. We were able to go long the parent and, sh and short another piece of the parent and create the stub for $3. Pretty shrewd, right? So, and not only that, because the business was so good and Comdex did well, the new guy took over, it looked good, this, this $3 went to $12. So sounds good so far for my worst investment, right? Uh, and we created it smartly, and it went from 3 to $12. Uh, so here's one thing about operating leverage that I didn't realize. You know how they were selling this space for $62, and it cost them $2, and that's great, because every square foot they added, they got $60, dropped straight to the bottom line. So who knows what would happen if the show shrunk, like less people rented space. Any thoughts? Yeah, you, every, every foot you lose, you also lose $60 straight to the bottom line. <laughs> okay? And, after the inter and apparently, um, what really was happening in Comdex and why it was gro wasn't growing, even though there were all kinds of peripherals and internet things related to the computers and everything else, is the internet shows were, you know, they became much more specialized. The computer box was really like a commodity. They didn't really have to be at Comdex for that long, and I think the internet boom was masking the fact that uh, that really their their main business, the computer business, was really shrinking during that time, and they were filling it up with all these ridiculous uh, new ventures that wanted to be there, and it was one of the big shows, and everyone was going to be there, and everything else. And actually, over a three-year period, I think the show shrunk from a million square feet to two hundred thousand, and then closed. And uh, and, uh, you know, me being shrewd, um, we got out at about one before it, it went <laughs> bankrupt. Uh, so we, it felt worse because, you know, we went from three to one, so it wasn't so bad, but it was really, it had gone up to 12, so that was pretty much terrible. Um, <laughs> So I hadn't, you know, I thought all the, you know, I didn't really understand the technology world that well, and clearly I didn't understand, you know, what could happen to a trade show business. Now there is no Comdex anymore. They actually closed the show. Uh, we had a large, it wasn't a very big company, and we had a large stake that was difficult to get out of was one of my excuses for not selling because I couldn't get out of a lot. So that's one of the disbenefits to owning a lot of a, a very liquid company. Um, and luckily, we made money that year anyway, because we had some other good stuff, but this was a killer. And, uh, you know, we, we analyzed it wrong, and then we're very slow. There were many, and you can imagine, there were many times along the way that we could have gotten out with a profit that we didn't. So we compounded our mistakes by uh, uh, waking up too late. Um, so I wish you hadn't asked that question. It just brings back bad memories. But anyway. <laughs> That's what happened. So, uh, and, I, and it didn't happen that long ago, which means that I've been doing this a long time and still goof up and uh, you know, took a home run and turned it not too good. You know, what I would say, I, I can't really speak too much about the China investment, but as far as utilities, what I'm seeing is that he's buying bonds. You know, the, we're, we're looking at our coupons from, you know, earnings as coupons, you know, that are growing. Okay? So I think that's what he's doing. He has a low cost of funds. The cost of funds in general are pretty low. He probably wouldn't have to borrow for a lot more than the foreign change of the 10-year bond, but yet he can create float for a lot cheaper. And if he can put that to work at 10 or 11 percent, you know, where it's regulated uh, 10 or 11 percent with a little growth and everything else, that's a pretty good return in today's market. So uh, he can do good returns on equity because he's getting some of his float from having an insurance company where it's not all equity that he has to put up. You know, if you, if you put up just a small amount of equity and get a lot of stuff to invest in, with leverage, that 10 percent can turn to his 15 percent no problem. And so I think. What he's doing is say, hey, that's a steady coupon, you know, 
energy demand is going to grow, regulated re return, uh, you know, where I have to get a return on my assets that's pretty good, much better than I can get elsewhere. And these are under, and, and this is a good way to put to work a lot of money. And that's, that's my guess as to what he's doing. In other words, he's making, he's doing a spread. He's borrowing his money cheap and investing at, you know, he owns a bond that pays a lot more money than he can get by actually owning a bond. Uh, so that would be my interpretation of what he's doing. I mean, that's what he's doing in all investments, right? I mean, you're just waiting for the coupon. You're hoping it grows and that eventually you'll be, you know, earning a good rate of return or that, look, this, this investment's only earning me 6% this year, but in five years, that coupon's going to be 15% because earnings are growing so much, you know, based on my current purchase price. And, you know, that's sort of another way to look at what you're doing, you know, if earnings are growing. And, and so your coupon will keep growing. You'd rather have that 6% growing to 15% and then still growing after that than a flat 6% a year for a period of time. Um, just go over a few things. Um, well, the market's been going down for the last few days, so why would Buffett say, you know, that sounds good? I don't mind that. It's $40 billion in cash. Can we say that? Right. It's, it's partially it's $40 billion in cash. Partially, like, um, I don't know, you're sitting in business school now. Even though it would seem terrible and probably not that many people would be hiring, if the market were to fall 40% while you're still sitting here, right, that would be better than if it does once you start, right? In other words, you, you now have, well, assuming that actually if it happened right and when you started, it would seem like a bad thing to do because it would be tough to get a job, but it would actually be a great opportunity for you over the next period of years where you'd now have a lot more upside in the investments that, that, that you can make. So if you have a long-term horizon, you're sort of rooting the market down to create opportunities, you know, and if you're going to be earning money. And I try to think of that when the market's going down. Um, uh, what's another part of uh, Buffett's strategy that he talks about? Uh, his portfolio strategy. Right. He, right. In other words, now he has to have some more names, but he's very concentrated for the amount of money he has. But if he had a small amount of money, he probably wouldn't own you know, 30 stocks. He'd own maybe at most five to eight different opportunities. He's actually owned 40% of a company. We're going to have a whole class about portfolio management, but one of the reasons, one of the ways to make money, one of the ways that we've been able to make money over time is two. One, we've stayed small. Two, we've stayed very concentrated. We concentrate on the five or eight positions that we feel the most confident about. And the best example I have of that is really, um, the best example of that is, is really a Buffett's example of you walk into town, you wouldn't go buy 30, you know, there's 30 different businesses in town. If you just sold your business for a million dollars and you wanted to reinvest in some of the businesses in town, uh, would you just take an equal stake in all 30 or would you try to analyze them and would you feel better if you, if you were good at analyzing businesses, wouldn't it be better to take, you know, pick five or seven of the businesses? Let's, let's even talk about five businesses just real quickly because we'll have a class on this. We talk about five businesses, um, and you put $200,000 into each. You, you analyze the 30 businesses. You pick your five favorites and put 200000 of each. You had just sold your business for a million dollars. We had all your money into one business. Now you're picking five businesses that you think are very good businesses in town that will be there for a long time, that have steady earnings, that have good clientele, that you know, maybe some of them have a brand name or, or uh, just a long-time business that you feel comfortable with. Does that sound... Risky, dividing that money up into five different places? To me, it doesn't sound that risky. And that's why, uh, that's why all the discussion about standard deviations and, and volatility and, and beta and all those things just sound silly to me. In other words, if you really, really believe what Buffett says, which is, I am buying a piece of a business. Okay? I'm buying a piece of a business, and if I bought the whole business, it would be, I'd be paying this, so I'm buying a piece of it at that valuation, and I think that's you know, 50 or 60% of what I think the business is worth, and I do that four or five times, to me, that's prudent investing. And once you start worrying about how the pricing of those businesses will 
jump around over six and 12 month periods, it starts to sound ridiculous. I mean, really analyzing risk that way, which is how most of the institutional investment world analyzes risk, uh, starts to sound completely ridiculous. And I think I would always, you know, whenever you get in that discussion, which you will be, you know, what was your sharp ratio? What was your standard deviation? You know, all those different things. Um, if you're really thinking about you're owning a piece of a business, you would never think if you were a real estate developer and owned five different properties that you thought you bought cheap or whatever, you know, the rents were paying me such and such, 15% a year, and I, I was able to buy it at that valuation, and I bought five of these. Would you care how it bounced around, you know, over a year and two period? You wouldn't even think of it. And it's the same way with businesses. And it's very important to think about because no one, very few people think that way. Very, very few people, and it's one of the secrets, one of the simple secrets. Uh, is really to look at your portfolio that way, just a, a group of businesses. And you probably wouldn't want to own 30 different businesses if you, if you could actually do the work. If you're doing a PE strategy, low PE strategy, then you sort of want the average return. So you've got to own a lot to get the average. But if you're actually doing work on businesses and understand them and understand that you're buying discounts, then, then you can really uh, own a few. Yeah? You know, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope. Um, you know, I think this is one of the few classes, I mean, few places you can take a class like this. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. It, you know, it, it almost, you know I, I understand the math. I just, uh, if you're buying a piece of a business, it's just different than, you know, who cares where, what other people are paying for it at a particular time. I care about what the cash flow, your risk is that the business turns down. The risk is that you know, they go from a million square feet to 200,000 square feet and then out of business um, you know, with $60 contribution margin for each foot. Um, you do have business, you're taking business risk. You're not taking volatility risk or you know, you're taking risk based on what is the income stream going to be you know, what are your coupons going to be from that investment? What are your earnings coupons going to be from that investment? That's the risk you're taking. If you understand that, and so you might want to have more than five, you might want to go to eight because you don't want to take that coupon risk from that business. But it has nothing to do with any of the, the measures, the volatility measures that are, that are used generally uh, to assess investments. Um, it is true that people are influenced by those, and if you're going to be one of those people, then you want to know how volatile your business investment's going to be. Having said that, looking at past betas or past volatility really will have nothing to do with future volatility, so uh, it's also suspect in that regard. You're making assessments that, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're figuring out your standard deviation of your portfolio, the only good way to do that is looking backwards, which really is not that helpful, because looking forward, you're making these estimates that, that make the results of your portfolio construction pretty much worthless, and then, you know, of course, Who's done a cross-correlation matrix between anyone? OK. You know, I don't get that either. You know, it's very uh, complicated uh, stuff to do. And, and people do it all the time. And it's hard to do. But it's all based on assumptions. You know, garbage in, garbage out. And I think most of the assumptions are garbage. Um, and I'm not sure that the output that you're looking for to figure out how volatile it'll be over a one-year period. Now, you know, for instance, when Rich Pizzino was in here, if you measured his volatility, his standard deviation over one-year periods, okay, he, his returns were, his standard deviation was equal to the standard deviation in the stock market, okay? So no benefit there. But if you looked at three-year trailing periods, okay, three, you know, just go three years, you know, rolling periods. So you go January of 87 to January 1990, February 87 to February 90, and like that you know, three-year rolling periods, then his volatility over three-year periods was half the market. So which one should you, so everyone who does these analyses uses 12-month annualized standard deviation. It's the wrong, it's, even if you want to use it, it's the wrong thing to use, okay? It really should be using three- and five-year uh, standard deviations over, over those kind of time frames. Then it may mean something. But even the way it's done, I mean, so, I think the whole process is just, you know, the efficient frontier and is just missing the boat, like, hugely. 
And I think it's taught because people have invested a lot of time learning the math. You know, I think Haugen wrote it up, said, you know, big investment in this theory, and it's, it ha it's elegant. It just makes assumptions that are completely unrealistic and, you know, not really that worthwhile in the real world. So um, I guess that's what I'd say about that, and I doubt that Buffett would, or I think he specifically said that. All right, so we covered that. I uh, wanted to make sure, we, I mentioned once again that you can't look at EBITDA without looking at maintenance capex. Uh, if you want to do, use EBITDA like uh, Charlie did uh, for comparables, uh, that's fine if it's only one metric and there's a good explanation for why you're doing that because the capex is unclear and everything else. It's just one more metric you could use, but only in a comparable sense, not in a valuation sense because EBITDA in itself means nothing. That's not how much cash you have. You, you have maintenance capex. Um, all right, uh, we talked about uh, previously Mr. Market, and Buffett's great example was the Washington Post story that he writes about where he said, gee, you know, at the time I bought the Washington Post for $100 a share, uh, if you'd asked any analyst on the street, you know, what would it be sold for if it was sold today, they all came out with four and $500, okay? Yet they weren't recommending it because, you know, it didn't look good for the quarter. So. Um, I think Mr. Market does crazy things sometimes, and that's great in, in the short term. And what I told you in the long term is Mr. Market gets it right. Okay? There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, who can name some reasons why Mr. Market gets it right over the long term? Short term, we read the paper, right? We saw stocks bounce around tons. Yet, um, so Mr. Market's crazy, then how does he get sane over the long term? Well, the fundamentals of business sort of reveal themselves over the long term. I think that's the big... Mm -hmm. uh, right, I think that's the big picture answer. There, there may be uncertainty right now and fear or whatever there might be in the stock price, but over time, let's, th whatever those fears or issues were, resolve themselves. Now, those it may take two or three years for those things to resolve themselves, but eventually they do, right? And then smart people, if it's still trading at a bargain, will buy it. People who are doing the analysis will buy it when the uncertainty is done. And that could take two or three years. It could happen in six months. could could happen in a week. Could happen. Generally, it happens within two to three years, almost always within two to three years. That happens. Uh, another thing that could happen is a uh, company sees their stocks cheap. They might buy it back. They may, they may buy it back when it's overpriced, but if a company sees a stock is really cheap, they may view that as a good investment. That's another way that stock prices get pushed up to fair value. Another way would be what? Takeover. takeover or threat of takeover, right? You don't even really have to have a takeover. Just, you know, if you buy all the shares up, that's all you own the company. So the, the fact that that can happen at some time, if there's not too many takeover barriers, means that the market, sh uh, eventually the stock will start trading towards what it's worth. Otherwise, someone's going to come in and do it for you, either a big company. So that's how Mr. Market gets rational over a period of time. And even statistically, if I look at it, it generally, on average, happens even in a year period. Uh, but almost always it happens within two to three years. Not always, but almost always it happens within two to three years. And that's such a powerful concept. It's like, forget the market, okay? I want to do my analysis. If there's a big enough discount, I'm going to assume that over the next two or three years, I'm going to get my money. And if you just keep thinking that way, it, it, forget about anything else. It becomes a very simple process. It becomes a process of how good a valuation can I do. And if the stock's at 10 and you think the valuation range is 15 to 20, that may be close enough, depending on wh where you th when you think it's going to be there. But even over two to three years, that's still a pretty good rate of return. So you might not have to pinpoint exactly what it's worth. But if you think 15 to 20, it's at 10, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the investments we had a number of years ago was uh, Foot Locker, uh, a simple investment. Um, and there, it was a very simple story. Stock was trading at 10 times earnings. Uh, stock was earning a dollar, and uh, it was trading at 10. Uh, it hadn't grown in a bunch of years. They thought they had you know, opened up enough stores, and uh, I guess that's why I was trading at 10. There was a bunch of cheap stuff out there. But we just 
did a little work. And they had a uh, chain, I think it was Champs, was one of their chains, uh, sporting goods. And basically it sold sneakers, but it was a big box store. They were losing a shirt in a, a number of these big box stores. Uh, and, and frankly, when you added it all up, they were losing 50 cents a share in these big boxes. And their regular little sneaker stores did very well. That was where all the money was being made. So really, they were earning a dollar fifty. You're getting the idea, right? They're earning a dollar fifty in the sh the sneaker store, losing fifty cents in these big box stores. And over the next three years, all these money losing stores were coming off lease. You know, one third, one third, one third. So what you really had was a dollar fifty in earnings, ten dollar stock. We came up with a valuation of somewhere between seventeen and twenty. And at ten dollars, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, and so, you know, that's, we didn't have to pinpoint the valuation or, or even know whether it was worth 22 or not. You know, we had plenty of margin of safety uh, to find that. And um, we didn't even have to predict the future that well. We could just assume, hey, you know, it's, the business stays flat, which we think it's growing, but let's say, assume it's flat, and we have this free money coming to us. So that's a good example of a good investment. Um, okay. All right, one more thing. I'll just, oh. Now, Melissa, what did we see on the way to, what did we see on the way to class today? <laughs> is that a true story? She asked me, he said, why'd that guy do that? <laughs> so I said, I'm going to ask you that in class. So, so we all know about cigar butts um, or cigarette butts or whatever. Uh, you know, Ben Graham did this for many years. Uh, I was going to ask her a really hard question, but, you know, that actually happened. So um, I said, why do you do that? He said, well... It didn't cost them anything, right? So if you can buy cheap enough, that was Ben Graham's philosophy of buying the net nets that you read about. Um, and Buffett sort of moved away from that. But that's, uh, I actually started, uh, how I got interested in this was in cigar butts. I read an article about Ben Graham's uh, net net strategy. Uh, and still the philosophy of buying something for a lot less than it's worth uh, makes sense. And on average, that, did, that strategy does work out uh, if you own enough of them. Uh, but what's the flaw there? There's a realization of value problem where uh, the business isn't creating any value while you wait. Right. In other words, here's what we're really looking for. You know, someone, a lot of people ask me, oh, do you, you really find a lot of 50 cent dollars? It's nice to say 50 cent dollars, but do you find a lot of 50 cent dollars? And what I'm really looking for is something that's traded 50 cents, and I think it's going to be a dollar maybe two, three years from now. And that's how I might find a 50 cent dollar, is the way I think about a 50 cent dollar. Um, now, if you think it's worth, 75 cents now and growing to a dollar in three years, you know, that's pretty good. Uh, but instead, if you bought a cigar butt for 37 and a half cents, a 50 cent dollar, and that's destroying capital, and it's down to 50 cents in three years, and you still don't have your money, your rate of return over that period of time, even though you didn't lose money, is not that great. So what you're really looking for is the 75 cents that's growing and not the 75 cents that's shrinking. And that's, that's where your margin of safety gets lost in the cigar butt, but still make, your, still make your money. So I guess what I would say is uh, I started there. I made some good money buying cigar butts. Um, and, and you can still make money doing that, but there are uh, better ways make a living. So, and Buffett's made a big point of saying that. Um, the only other concept I, I wanted to uh, talk about, um, not even a concept, just uh, a measure. Uh, you know, Buffett talks about owner earnings. 
okay? And he basically, uh, what, what's his formula for owner earnings? Right. So he has net income plus DA minus CapEx. And I'm telling you to use EV all the time, right? And pre-tax for that matter, you know, because of different borrowing rates. And so in case anyone was going to ask that, why do I tell you to do it? And this is Warren Buffett, so, you know, why shouldn't you listen to him? And this works fine as long as the company's not particularly leveraged and has normal tax rates. Um, and I think that's what he's talking about when you're doing it that way. And otherwise, uh, when you're doing your papers, I'd want to see the EV analysis. Um, and the other thing I w would want to see uh, before I let you go is uh, not only the EV analysis, uh, but also, uh, obviously, your return on tangible capital uh, analysis. I'd like to see some comparables. So when you write your page up, you can list, you know, this was cheaper than comparables, this and that, but I want to see the comparable analysis on the back pages. Uh, you can describe the basic thesis like was done here. Uh, you can use these Charlie examples. I have another one. This was the most recent write-up. What happens now when he writes something up, the stock sort of goes up a lot. So you've got to find someone else that, for good reason. Here. This is just his most recent one that he wrote up in July. Yeah. Uh, when you say you want a comparable analysis, you mean just one source of comparable, you want to look at a couple of analysis? Let's assume you're doing an analysis. If you're very comfortable that this is a, you know, I would feel more comfortable with more comps. Sometimes there aren't. Um, and I'd want an explanation <laughs> of that. Well, you shouldn't average the P-E ratios of comps, right? Why shouldn't you do that? Right, different cap structures. You know, you want to, you want, I want to see an EV now. You know, you see that on analyst reports. You say, oh, the average PE for the industry is, you know, 13. But if, and if they, none of them have any debt or all have the exact percentage of debt equal, which is rare, then that's fine. But if they don't, that's kind of a worthless analysis. Also, you might want to do a bunch of comps, but then say, you know, these two are the closest. These are the ones that I think are, are the closest. Now, what's wrong with comparable analysis? Right, yeah, they may could be all overpriced or all underpriced, and so that's just going to be one of your valuation. Um, I don't mind looking at a dividend discount model if it's, uh, you know, give me the assumptions and you pick conservative assumptions, but that's just more of a check to see whether you're close. Um, you know, I, w I really want to understand a, the bit why you're comfortable of projecting the business or why you're not comfortable projecting the business after looking at it forward. And, you know, I, I would once again look at it as a coupon that I'm going to be receiving over a period of time uh, and base your valuation on that. Um, but I, I'd like to see all different kinds and see how they check out, you know, between the comparables, between the dividend discount model, between any other analysis that you're going to be doing. Uh, any other questions on anything or the assignment? Yeah. For your return on tangible assets, can you look at a business that has significant intangible assets that are, I don't mean goodwill, but Nextel International an example, that spectrum isn't a tangible asset in the sense it's not a machine, but it's not goodwill either. Would, would you include that, or would that, or would it simply be, is that included in your tangible assets? Well, How do you account for it, I guess, in that situation? Right. In other words, uh, the question is, the balance sheet is what the balance sheet is. In other words, they have, they have a certain amount of working capital. They have a certain amount of fixed assets in the business, right? If they already own the spectrum and they don't have to keep buying more spectrum, right? It's not relevant. If, it's, if part of their growth plan in, in your projections is they're going to buy Venezuela's spectrum and they're going to buy, buy Brazil's spectrum, and that's the way they're going to expand, then you've got to include that as part of your CapEx because you're going to have to keep buying the spectrum, okay? You, you, you know, in, in that, that one example on NII, uh, you'd have two valuations. Look, Mexico is earning X amount of money, the, their business in Mexico. They're not really using the spectrum they have in these other countries. Uh, I would try to put a value on that. 
you know, what, what is that spectrum? Either if they sold it or, you know, what's it worth? Uh, what do you think it might be worth in the future and then discount heavily since they haven't opened the business? Anything else? How, how does that, I'm sorry, I'm new to this, but how does that specifically affect your return calculation? And you're saying if they don't have to, if there's no further reinvestment, you wouldn't, you'd stick to the hard, tangible assets? Well, the reason for that, the reason for that is what we're really trying to come up with is the incremental return on capital for any money reinvested in the business, okay? So incrementally, it's not, not, we're not trying to really, even though we are calculating the historical return on capital, we're doing that to try to understand the business going forward. What, what is the nature of the business going to be going forward? So we're really looking to the incremental return on capital as an indicator. You might not get that. You, in the past, they might have done that, but now they're saturated, and they're going to cannibalize their business, and they're not going to get those returns on capital when they open the new stores. That could happen, and you have to make that assessment. But as my first best guess, as just the broad thing I want to do is what kind of business am I dealing with? What kinds of return on tangible capital have they gotten in the past? And what we're trying to do, if, we, if I say that what I'm really trying to get at is what is the future incremental return on capital going to be in the business? And I don't have to keep on buying that spectrum. However, I may saturate that market. You know, or I may have to build more towers to use the spectrum. And that's going to be a capital expense you know, as I get more subscribers or whatever it might be. And so that's, you know, those are things that are real capital spending. But buying the spectrum again, maybe you don't have to do that. Okay. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, if, you, if you're just looking forward, th that's why you do. Even though you're looking backwards to figure out the number, you're looking forward. And that's why you're looking, uh, you're looking forward as to how you're going to do. Um, so Matt Mark will be here next Friday. Um, and he will be doing bankruptcy investing. Who do you think asked the... The best question of the day, though. <laughs>